the Lord. We're going to read a second Corinthians chapter four, four to eight, uh, four to eleven, and it says, "In whom the God of this world hath blinded." The minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Uh, we're going to read verse number four again. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul had stated that the God of this world is out for that purpose, to blind the minds of people so they cannot believe and they stay lost or without hope in this world. In fact, it states clearly that this blindness in par is part of them first so that when the light of the glorious gospel of Christ comes unto them by means of a minister of the truth, they believe not because they cannot see the light. Though people are in darkness at the time of the reception of the gospel of Christ, it does shine. But if they believe not, it is because of that uh, shining light that didn't get into their heart. Something was wrong. They didn't allow it to shine in their heart there they were still blinded and so according to the apostle paul the power of satan is the, the his power tries to stop the light of the gospel from shining forth into their heart and soul and he tries to do so and it all depends, I think, on uh, the purity and what what uh, the heart is really like. So one might say that they sometimes are not receptive. Their hearts are not repented of the evil deeds that they do. Though they try to appear righteous, per se, in a sense, unto men not showing their actually the dastardly deeds that they do when the light of the gospel shines it is because every man no doubt is in darkness until that touch and that light comes to them the touch of the savior jesus christ must illuminate or shine unto them but he's really the one that can manifest himself unto them and so the light of the gospel can shine because it has the power too. But there is a voluntary will in each man, whether or not he wants to believe. So it is the Savior that is in that message who has to shine towards them. So what is so powerful, the true gospel message is the message of the one who died for us. He is Christ. He is the image of God. In John chapter 14, verse number 21, it says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me,
And he that loveth me shall be loved to my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. So there is a manifestation of Jesus Christ that comes unto the person who, according to this, according to Jesus, uh, obeys his commandments. And so, what has been stated by Jesus Christ himself is the one who keeps the commandments of God will be the one that God loves and soon thereafter the love of God will be shown to the person by a manifestation or a revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. That is God's love towards mankind. For Jesus to reveal himself, it is because of people who wish to know who Jesus Christ really is. And it is because they keep his commands. For the people who wish to delight God, they should get to know what his commands are for today. For there will be a revelation of Jesus Christ himself in, his, in doing the commandments of, uh, of God. One way to show the truth is by looking at the time of the day of Pentecost. The 120 who stayed in the upper room praying for the experience of the Holy Spirit were the ones who were obeying Jesus' commandment of doing so because he said to stay in Jerusalem until you be endued for, with power from on high. That's what he said. And 120 stayed. There were others that didn't. I don't know why. But they there were 120. When the day of Pentecost came, and they had received the gift of the Holy Ghost, the revelation of who Jesus Christ came to them that day, even to those in the upper room that had a miraculous spiritual experience and then were preached to by pre Peter who gave the word of God. Of course, many of them, no doubt, believed that he was the son of God because he res was resurrected from the dead. And uh, according to Thomas, he was his Lord and his God. So some of them did believe totally that he was the Lord, his God. But then the Bible says that in Matthew 28 that there were some that believed, but some still doubted. So even with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that no doubt would be a wonderful experience to see Jesus Christ and his resurrection. But some still doubted. That's amazing. And so let me go ahead and read it for you. Because that that uh, verse really is quite shocking. How that, you know, they could see Jesus face to face, his resurrection, and there's still doubt. So it says in Matthew chapter 28. Hallelujah. And let's go to <clears throat> um, verse number 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And then when they saw and when they saw him, that's verse number seventeen, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now here, who are these people? It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus appointed them. Eleven disciples. These are the ones that were with him for three and a half years. And they knew that he was crucified. They knew he died. And seeing him again again, no doubt he was resurrected. He had the nail prints in his hands. He had the feet to show it. How can you doubt? Well, it says, verse number 17, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Well, is that talking about uh, Thomas? Well, Thomas became a believer. Here it's talking about when they saw him, they doubted. Not before they saw him. According to this, verse number 17 says clearly, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So that was when they saw him. Thomas doubted because he didn't see him. But some doubted when they saw him. Now that's a whole nother, another uh, really doubt. 
really doubting. And then Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all, way, even unto the end of the world. Now, now Jesus there didn't uh, just go ahead and uh, rebuke them, but he just presented himself to them. Now, later on, of course, the Holy Sp they came into the upper room, so they were ready to receive the Holy Spirit. They did what God commanded to them to do by staying in, the, uh, in Jerusalem. And then they were in the upper room, and they were there receiving uh, on the day of Pentecost the Spirit of God. And so uh, when that happened, of course, um, Peter began to preach who Jesus really was. So we look at that, and we know that there will be a revelation of Jesus Christ because Jesus had just said, uh, what I just read, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So the commandment was to wait in Jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high. So I can go ahead and read that scripture also. That is in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, uh, first chapter, before the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. So it says, Acts chapter 1, verse number 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So that is the commandment. Don't depart from Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father. In other words, receive the Holy Spirit before you go anywhere. Which saith he, he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So here, this is a commandment that they not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. So they were to receive the Holy Spirit. And then... It says in verse number 8, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, in both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So it was a commandment for them to stay in Jerusalem. And um, here we find that 120 did. So those that obeyed received an extra revelation that is from preaching from Peter on the day of Pentecost was about what the Holy Ghost is, was about Jesus Christ, about his resurrection, and of course his death, burial, and resurrection. And then also who Jesus is, he's the Son of God, he's Christ, Acts 2.36. Now Acts 2.36, uh, Peter is actually presenting who Jesus is. Not just what he did, but who he is. So in Acts chapter 2, in verse number 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, and here it is, both Lord and Christ. So Christ, the Son of God, Lord, he is God. He is the ruler. He is the Father, Christ, the Son, Lord, he's God. He's the Father. He's the Creator. So he presented uh, Jerusalem, and even those who were in the upper room, they received that revelation because they were the ones who were obeying what Jesus said. They, I believe, they really received the revelation. And then those outside of the room that listened to him, and preached, and they were convicted, and they obeyed also. They received the revelation. When we obey him, that's what it says here, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So there was a manifestation of Jesus Christ that day, Peter had given the manifestation. 
he had said that it was that he was the Lord. The Lord, and of course we know the Lord meaning God. <laughs> meaning he's the Father. He's the creator. And that's what John also said. John the Revelator, <laughs> as we call him today. The Apostle John in John 1.10. He was in the world as the Son of God. And the world was made by him as the Father. And the world knew him not as both the Father and the Son. So, when people uh, obey him by receiving the Holy Spirit, getting baptized in Jesus, repenting, getting baptized in Jesus' name and receiving the Holy Spirit, there is that love manifested by people to do that. That is the commandment that Peter had given to those to those on the day of Pentecost who asked him, what shall we do? Well, he said what to do. Okay, there's the commandment. That commandment actually is from Jesus, we could say, because the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. And so he's telling everybody to repent, get baptized in Jesus' name. And he said specifically Jesus' name and to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, those who did so, and 3,000 of them, they were added unto the church. Amen. So I believe that the ones in the upper room that yet did not believe, yet did not have all of the belief per se, because the Matthew 28 says some worshipped and others doubted of the 11. And so all that doubt was removed uh, and they were strongly holding to what they believed. And then they received the revelation because of their obedience. They received the revelation of that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And he is Christ. He's God. He's the Father. He is the Son of God. He's Christ. He's the Messiah. And so... They really did receive it. And then those on the outside of the room, on the, uh, the street, they also received a blessing because they obeyed. And then the revelation came to them. So if we obey and then uh, follow that concept, hallelujah, and uh, seek and continue in that, God can give the revelation to people, but yet he is the one who will manifest himself. So he's, he is the one who looks at the heart. And so it was also in John 14. How? Uh, let's go ahead and read it. <clears throat> John chapter 14. John chapter 14 says... Okay, so here it says. Um, this is talking about um, Philip. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, all uh, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffice us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath me, seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Um, so he was trying to divide up the Father and the Son, but actually Jesus was saying that I am He. I am the Father. And of course He was a human being. He was the Son too. So He could also speak as the Father. He could speak as the Son because He played those two roles. Alleluia. Glory to Jesus. And so we come to verse number 22. John chapter 14 and verse number 22. It says, 
Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? So he didn't really understand. I mean, if there's going to be a manifestation for people in the world or people on earth, how is it possible that you show yourself to us and not to the people of the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, verse 23, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which he hears is not mine, but the Father which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. Verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I said unto you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither yet let it be afraid. So here, Jesus Christ was saying, um, about, in verse number um, 21, that Jesus would love him, and of course the Father would love him, and then he would manifest himself unto him, and will manifest myself to him. To him. So, um, and then verse number uh, 24 talks about, He that loveth me not keeping not my sayings. Um, well, <clears throat> Acts 2, Peter was preaching. He told him exactly what to do, and those that believed, those that obeyed, they could receive a revelation as well. And then he talks about here in verse number 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. So the Comforter is uh, that which one can receive, especially if one is obedient to what Jesus had said. Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem until they had been oh, oh, endued from power, with power from on high. But he still says today, the commandment is, receive the Holy Spirit. His people, he wants them to repent, to be baptized. In Jesus' name, receive the Holy Spirit. That is the commandment. And so, those who would obey would receive not only that, but the revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. Amen. So, the 120 who stayed in the upper room praying for the experience of the Holy Spirit were the ones who were obeying Jesus' commandments of doing so. When the Holy, when this day of Pentecost came, they had received the Holy, gift of the Holy Ghost and the revelation through the message. And I believe that they actually understood. It was completely understood from that moment on. And uh, that kind of like opened the door for the Spirit of God to work in their minds and help their minds to realize who Jesus Christ really was. And what they should preach to people was given to them on the day of Pentecost. With that first message, and that was kind of like the foundation, uh, the start of the church, and it even talks about that that was the apostles' doctrine, and then uh, three thousand were added to the church. So that means that they really did what they needed to do because they were added to the church. That's what it says, Acts chapter two. Now let's go ahead and look at it again. So since they were told by Peter to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. It says, repent. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so that is what they were to do. And so then, verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word, that is, they repented. They were baptized in Jesus' name. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. In the same day, 
were, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So when they did that, then they were added to the church. So that is the thing, the command that people need to do in order to be added to the church. In verse number 42, here it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So that was named as the apostles' doctrine. What Peter preached was named the apostles' doctrine. What the people should do, what Jesus did. Who the Holy Spirit is, who Jesus is. What, the, what he did for us, what we need to do. And if we obey the command, hey, there's going to be a blessing. A blessing not only of receiving the Holy Spirit, of receiving forgiveness, but also receiving the manifestation or the revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. So, Jesus was revealed to the Jews that day, public in a public manner, who Jesus is. So, um, they surely knew him that he was the Messiah, the son of the God. But on that day, Peter, who had the keys, expounded to the group, gathered that Christ was not only the son of God, that is the, the group that was in the upper room, I believe, they did understand that he was the son of God. I don't think there was any doubt to that, but, you know, whether or not he was God himself, that that might not have been clear to them. But when Peter preached then and what they had received, they they just did believe. I believe that from <laughs> they must have. And so they Peter, ex, who had the keys, because Jesus said that I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and and uh, so he used those keys. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He preached the message of how to enter into the kingdom of heaven using those keys to show the people this is the entrance right here. This is how to get in to the door. It's like the ark, the Noah's ark, you know. Here's the door. Noah knew exactly where the door was. They had made that door and they had the animals go in that door and then the uh, people went in that door and there was only one door. Well, here Peter is showing the people this is the door. This is how you enter and this is what you got to do. This is what Jesus uh, did for us and here you have to enter through that door. So he expounded to the group, gathered that Christ was not just the Son of God, but he was also Lord. That is, he was the Father. Therefore, those who listened to the commandments of Jesus Christ obeyed them by staying and praying in Jerusalem. There with the others not only received the Holy Spirit, but he, they also received the manifestation of his presence in them, which was the Holy Ghost, and also the revelation of who Jesus Christ was. And is. Therefore, it follows that Jesus said that the ones that kept his commandments had Jesus revealed to them, not only in the way of receiving the Holy Spirit, and that's a, the presence of God inside of us, but also receiving the announcement that Jesus Christ is both, both Lord and Christ. John 1 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So it depends on the heart. The heart was ready, the, the light shined forth. John chapter 3, 19 to 21. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. So that is important. Therefore, the ones who were there, the 120, came to the light because they were doing the truth. But those who did not like the light were not there. They wouldn't come. Those in the street who had to hear the truth came to the light by repenting. At least um, 
3,000 of them, being baptized and receiving the Holy Ghost too. They received the manifestation of, or the revelation of who Jesus Christ really was and is. They began their belief in Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 57 to 58, it says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that their labor is not in vain in the Lord. I would say then that the victory is given to his people through the Lord Jesus Christ. And doing his work is what needs to be done, for it is not in vain. It is not a useless work. It is the work of the truth, and it is the work that has eternal benefits. But those who rejected or did not listen with belief at what was stated, the gospel was hidden from their viewpoint. Yet the Apostle Paul mentions to the Corinthians that the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine. What image do those who do not believe receive? Well, they really are still in darkness. According to the Apostle Paul, they have not received the light of the glorious God, the gospel of Christ shining in them because they were still blinded. Therefore, the only other logical conclusion is they can't be Christ. In Romans, we learn whoever does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And uh, so the enemy, Satan, tries to keep people from the power of the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. So he, they can remain under the blindness of and not being changed by the shining light of the glorious gospel of Christ. When they believe the truth of the glorious gospel of Christ and they obey it, then they are delivered completely out of that darkness and come into the truth and have the light in them. So, the light can come to a person, but it comes by believing it's kind of like a step one has to believe and then repent and believe that what that person is saying is true and that I do need to repent and then get baptized and believing who Jesus really is and then uh, receiving the Holy Spirit there is a revelation that comes there is a beauty of the Spirit of God receiving that beautiful Holy Spirit the Apostle ben Paul mentioned it is the glorious gospel of Christ. It is not our gospel. It is his gospel. He paid for it with his own blood. Verse 5 says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So, in other words, he was saying that they preach Jesus not really themselves. Of course, Paul did mention the things that he went through because of the gospel message and that he had received such a beautiful, uh, wonderful education, a religious education, but that for him uh, served for nothing is what he kind of mentioned. But he was preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so that is what they preached and what um, the minister should preach about Jesus. And then, after the semicolon, it says, and yourselves, your servants, and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. So they were saying that they were servants for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the gospel message. So the Apostle Paul was stating what they were doing. They were preaching about uh, Jesus, the gospel message, which is about him and what people need to do so that they can receive the Spirit of God in them, clean out their the sin by getting baptized in Jesus' name. That's about him, his name. So this is the for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
and for the sake of people to have salvation. One, um, so it is for salvation, for preaching about Jesus is preaching the way, uh, preaching people the way to the truth and to salvation. If they preach themselves only um, without Jesus in it, well, how can you get the message of the gospel that way? We have to have Jesus in it. Surely one can testify of what God has done for a person. Hey, Jesus said that ye are witnesses unto me. And then uh, different places. And so uh, it is It is wonderful to hear about what Jesus does for people when they come to this light of the gospel. There are certain people that have been in serious dilemmas really drag down but even those who uh, just kind of like on the day of Pentecost who um, were not <laughs> the whole multitude was probably not on drugs or um, alcoholics or nothing none of that they were religious people and uh, so they they probably and we're just a religious group of people. But yet even they, the testimony about them coming to God was also a very intriguing fact. That's the first, um, first group of people that came into the church was those who were religious. Uh, well, maybe the second because the 120, some of them may not have been quote unquote religious when Jesus had met them, like the tax collector, Matthew may not have been totally religious and uh, et cetera. But we can say that that experience of those who, even if they are religious people and come to this faith, that's a testimony and those who are deep into drugs or alcohol or other things coming to Jesus, that's a testimony too. So there's both sides. And even though that, you know, in Acts, it doesn't talk about people that were drug addicts and all of this stuff and coming into the, we have that stuff today, in Amer especially in America. But um, even religious people, they can come in to the truth, but they they have to listen and have that gospel shine into their hearts. They have to be able to believe what it says, what they what that what it, what that gospel is, and who and 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 then obey it and find out who Jesus is. And so they were not preaching themselves, but they were preaching about Jesus Christ the Lord and they could no doubt Paul had done it many times he had preached about his testimony how he was on the road to Damascus and the light came shining down and God changed him so his his conversion also was a conversion of a religious person a religious person who was not in the truth and he was blinded you know, Paul had just said, and uh, we just read, we can say, Paul just uh, told us through this particular uh, verse here, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So he had been blinded by the enemy uh, about the way of truth about Jesus Christ until. That light shined to him. Jesus Christ came to him personally. Well, there was a group there. But he was the one who saw Jesus. They didn't. The light was there for all of them, but he received um, the message of who Jesus was. Who art thy Lord? He had to ask because he really didn't know. And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. So, um, Paul, or Saul, was a religious person who didn't have the shining light of the gospel in him. He was actually persecuting. He was actually against it. So, they said, 
All right, all right, Apostle Paul said, we've preached not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. In other words, they can testify, they can preach about Jesus, they can testify what Jesus has done in them, but basically they're not preaching themselves, lifting themselves up, they're lifting Jesus up. In fact, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Amen. If they preach themselves only, how can one get the message of the gospel? Surely one, uh, one can testify of what God has done, bringing the person to the truth amid a serious dilemma, sometimes miracles that will bring glory to God. Further, the Apostle Paul emphasized that the ministers, or he himself as an apostle, were the servants, the servants for Jesus' sake ministering to the Corinthians for their salvation and getting them into the truth and helping them to find their way walking towards Jesus. And that was their what they were helping them do. And as Jesus taught his disciples in the upper room when he had washed their feet, he said the following words in Luke chapter 22, 25 to 27. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise lord authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater... He that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Thus the teaching here from the Lord regarding one who is the greatest is the fact that the greatest among them are those who serve. Jesus was serving them by washing their feet. The teaching was not in regards, well, Jesus did not, it doesn't say anything about who actually brought the meal, the food, uh, we expect or we think maybe the disciples were the ones who did that. Um, but the role of the servant was to wash the feet. And so Jesus took that role of the servant and washed his own disciples' feet that day. Of course, he didn't do it before that. And he had gone many places and maybe... As custom was, the servants came to wash their feet. But Jesus didn't do it that. But he did do it in this particular day. And that shocked Peter. Lord, what are you doing? No, no, no. Don't do that. But Jesus was giving a, an example that he was their servant. So the reason... Um, the servants were the ones who washed the feet of those who entered the room. It must have been that no one had washed the disciples' feet, but Jesus went ahead, and he did so. Verse number 6 says, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When the Apostle Paul is mentioning this part, he's referring to Genesis. For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, that's referring to Genesis. That is where, on the first day, God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Thus the light shined out of darkness due to the word of God. Yet here the Apostle Paul is comparing this to our hearts, for our hearts, hearts, were in darkness, one could say. Then the light of the God, glorious gospel of Christ came into our hearts and shined. And maybe God has to speak for that. Yes, true, God has to speak. But he speaks through the minister preaching about the gospel. And so it shines, or can shine, depending on on whether or not Jesus manifests himself or the light just shines in that heart and uh, begins to deal with that heart. And 
Peter on the day of Pentecost was preaching. There were more than 3,000 there gathered, I'm sure. There were probably uh, over 5,000 probably there. And 2,000 walked away and said, uh, that's not for me. But 3,000 said, yes, this is right. And so there were people who still maintained their, their darkness of their heart. But others decided, no, this is right. And they came in. So the Apostle Paul is comparing this to our hearts. For our hearts were in darkness. Then the light of the gospel of Christ began to shine, giving us that light, which we needed to actually see who Jesus is and the true gospel message. Without that certain light, one is blind to who Jesus really is and the true message of the gospel. They cannot understand why this and that of the message, if that darkness is still there. They may then accept something that is not the truth and not the true message of the gospel. It truly depends on one's heart and opening up one's heart and having that true message of the gospel penetrate and shine and obey it. Verse number seven says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Within our vessels, that is our bodies, there is the treasure. Of course, we have the spirit of God. That is the biggest treasure. And then the gospel message, the idea who Jesus is, and there may be much more treasure within us that we don't know at this point, all of what is, ha what is in there. For God provides us to things we, that we receive of his spirit, but also of his word and revelations, manifestations, things that we come to understand. And so we store up the hidden wis wisdom of Christ. And the power, as the Apostle Paul states, is of God. It's not of us. His power dwells in us. It is the, his spirit that resides in us and giving us the power of God. That treasure is, yes, the power, the excellency of the power. His spirit dwelling in mankind. One notice in the histor historical accounts, when the Ark of the Covenant was taken to the camp of the Philistines, God used it to bring judgment upon them. Many of them had died. They figured it out. It was because it was the Ark of the Covenant, but they weren't totally sure. They had to test it to see if it was. But in the end, they did realize that it was. So God was causing a lot of trouble with them because of it. If we compare that to the present day church, the people who have the Spirit of God, <laughs> we are carrying that Ark of the Covenant. We are carrying, carrying the Spirit of God, the power that even the world they, when, if we are together worshiping Jesus Christ and they come into a church service, they can feel there's something here, something there. That power is there. And so um, the Holy Ghost in, is in God's people. And it is different than the world. In verse number eight, it says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. The Apostle Paul brings out the fact they had trouble. He mentions it as on every side. In other words, uh, seemed like everywhere they went, trouble awaited them. If they went this way, there was trouble. If they went that way, there was trouble. And they were the ministers of the new covenant. And that brought about a spiritual warfare. So that's why the trouble came. And so it seemed like there were so many that opposed them, but there were some that did receive and were changed. They became believers. They received the message of the gospel. 
They had that light shine in them, taking their hearts out of that darkness and having it shine deeply within their souls. And that's why we have the Corinthian church. Yeah, Corinthians. They had met up with opposition on every side, but they were not, as he stated, distressed. Yet not distressed, it says. There were times they were perplexed, that is, baffled, baffled confused. What's going on? What's the deal here? Trying to figure out what would happen next or what the opposition might do to them. Yet at the same time, they were holding on to Jesus, which gave them hope. They were not in despair. Amen. They did have hope in him, and really, that is where hope lies. They felt like they were persecuted. Persecuted. Verse number nine. But they were not forsaken by God who was with them. Jesus said himself that he would be with us till the end of the world. He would be with us everywhere we go in this world. Of course, when we go out of this world and go back to heaven, there he's going to be with us too. But... Amen. Hallelujah. So he is with us and giving us comfort because the Holy Spirit has come. And he is the Holy Spirit. He gives us comfort. Amen. When? They are persecuted too. So we could say probably even more comfort when we are persecuted. Or as the Apostle Paul had received stripes or whatever punishment they may received, have received for Christ's sake. And then it said, he said, as written, as cast down, but not destroyed. They were, they were still in Christ. And even though, you know, the Apostle Paul lost his life, he was still in Christ, he was still, he still held on to life itself. So it is stated that they had born in them the dying of the Lord Jesus, meaning that they would, of course, die to, um, you know, have that particular, maybe, bearing. It says always bearing about something that was in their body, maybe because of the stripes or what have you. It, it, it seemed like um, they were receiving death threats and etc. while they preached the gospel. And of course, they would also die to their flesh. And he talked about that before. In verse number 11, it says, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The apostles and minister had taught this. Amen. They had taught this. That those that are alive in Christ seem to be delivered unto death for the sake of Jesus. That is, those who were ministering like that. One always keeps himself into subjection to the Spirit of God, not to the flesh. When the flesh is no good thing, there is no good thing. In the Spirit of God, there is life. And of course, that we have in us. Jesus is in us. It shows the world that God dwells in us, having the holy presence of God. And even though that they were facing mm, death threats here and there, and everywhere they went, no, uh, fear of losing their lives for the sake of the gospel, such as when he even started preaching in Damascus, when he got to Damascus, he started to preach about who Jesus was. <laughs> even then, just at the beginning, he was faced with death. They wanted him dead, but he escaped again and again. But then, in the end, he was killed. He became a martyr.
for Jesus Christ. May God bless you today. In the name of Jesus. Amen.